there existed here in New Orleans in the 1880s up till 1903 when he died, a Christian musician by the name of uh, Frederick Kitziger. And he worked during those years at Toro Synagogue as music director and composer. And the reason he was hired, I think, was because he was from Germany, born in the 1840s. And the rabbi at that time at Toro Synagogue, Rabbi Leucht, was also from Germany, born in the 1840s. So they probably felt very comfortable with each other. And if he wasn't Jewish, well, then most musicians in American synagogues, reform synagogues at that time, weren't Jewish anyway. And during that time, Kitziger wrote more synagogue music, I believe, than any other composer, any other Jewish composer in, or whatever religion, in North America at that time. He published four complete cycles of the year, plus all sorts of incidental um, for individual psalms and whatever. Now, what, what are the rough time frame dates of publications? Uh, they would be in the uh, middle to later 1880s up till about 1900. The first being in the early 1880s? Right, yes. Published here? Uh, published by himself, basically. They were uh, engraved by himself. Uh, you can see it's their hand copies, but they were printed and uh, reproduced. And he advertises in there that they're available. They were being used by synagogues in 24 states, in Canada and in England. So it had wide circulation. You, you've yeah. determined that it did actually have? One of his compositions seems to be so well known that every cantor in America and perhaps around the world jokes about it. And that is his setting of the psalm, What is man that thou art mindful of him for Yom Kippur? Set it in English to the Moonlight Sonata of Beethoven. And that seems to have made every cantor joke book in, in, the, in the country. Is that the only? case of the Moonlight Sonata, or is there another one that Schlesinger... No. Um, is this the one? That's the one, and there are others. Uh, there's, uh, it may have been Schlesinger who set an aria by Donizetti. Yeah, that, that's, that's also, the, yeah. That's, yeah. But the Moonlight Sonata... That's, the that's Kitziger. It's Kitziger that's, only. That's Kitziger, right. as far as I know, the only one. Um, and uh, do, you, do you know if that is actually done anymore, anywhere in the United States? As far as I know, it is not. Except when I revive it and have people play it for... But that's a historical kind right, of situation. Right. I'm, see, I'm not sure. I these pinned down. I, I hear reports that in somewhere in either Alabama or Texas or somewhere that, 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 that there are some old classic reform temples that are still doing that, but I have to check that. I think that if you were here 30 years ago, that would have been the case. Kitziger uh, lived all his life in New Orleans? Uh, no. He came here from... Yeah, well, he came here from Germany. Yeah. Uh, he came from a very poor family. And uh, he went to study at the Leipzig Conservatory. He's, his instrument was either trumpet or trombone. We're not quite sure. It was a brass instrument. And w while he was a student at Leipzig, he made uh, a terrible mistake. He fell in love. I guess it wasn't a mistake. He fell in love with a young lady, and he proposed to her. And the father stepped in and said the inevitable question, how are you going to support her? Poor to start with and going to be a musician? Ha, ha, ha. So uh, he had to figure a way of making money quickly. So he did what I guess many uh, people did in the 19th century. He sailed for New Orleans right away, figuring America was made of gold. And it worked for him. He came here in 1866, right after the Civil War, with his horn, went into the streets of New Orleans, paraded on the streets of New Orleans, blowing his horn. And after one year, he had enough money saved to buy a farm in Crowley, Louisiana, to go back to Germany and claim his bride, which now the father-in-law was willing to let him do because he had money. And he came back here and started to raise a family and have a farm. The problem was that he was no farmer. And after one year, he went bankrupt, having lost everything. Not a single seed came above the ground. So uh, he came back to New Orleans and did what he knew best, which was to be on the streets, blowing his horn. And he was able to make a living, raise a family, gradually working up. He played in, in one of the opera orchestras here and also took jobs occasionally playing on Sundays in, in church services, playing the organ. He had enough skill on the keyboard, apparently. He played at least once at St. Louis Cathedral, and he played at several of the Episcopal churches here in town. That's what also leads us to some confusion. There's no way of pinning him down as either Catholic or Protestant. The only thing we know is that he wasn't Jewish. I'm just thinking, has one gone to, uh, in Germany, to baptismal records? I went after those. We, we corresponded, and we're not able to find Nothing. anything. Apparently he was sufficiently poor that he may not even have had <laughs> records kept, whatever. But uh, he's, uh, uh, he had ample skills to be able to compose. He's not a great composer, but uh, he provided functional music at that time for reform synagogues in America. Why did, why did he do it? Why did, did, did it purely uh, 
just a need for self-expression, or was it a no. function of something that was necessary, was needed? It was needed in the congregation. Uh, there was a number of things. First of all, uh, the, uh, until the 1890s, there was no standardized prayer book in the Reform Movement. Some prayer books were in German, some in English, some in both English and German. A few even had Hebrew. And uh, we find in his compositions, uh, many times there will be three texts, one in English, one in German, and one in Hebrew. And since there was this fluidity, fluidity of text, uh, there had to be different compositions written to satisfy it. It was written for four-voice chorus, sometimes with a soloist, which was what many of these synagogues hired. They hired four Christian singers to come in, two, soprano, or two females, two basses, to have a regular soprano, alto, tenor, bass choir. And uh, he had to provide the music. There was no repertory, for, and he simply brought in his Christian style of music and set the text. He probably had some help in the English, but no doubt had the rabbi help him in the Hebrew setting. There again, uh, you say his Christian style of music, uh, I've seen some, and... Uh, Protestant. It's so. clearly, yeah, more, uh, more Protestant than... Protestant chorale uh, type, uh, Lutheran chorale type style. I don't know whether that tells us anything about his own... Thing. No, because I think you had the, some Catholics doing that as well. As well. Yeah. He may have been nothing. You know, born a Christian, but not practicing anything. He's buried in a cemetery where he, it's a non-denominational cemetery, but I don't think there are any Jews in the cemetery. His descendants, some of them are Protestant and some are Catholic, which is further reason why we suspect there might have been a mixture of, or he wasn't committed to one or the other. What year did he die? 1903. Now, uh, during that time frame, uh, his music was done in more than his synagogue in New Orleans? Well, at that time there were three Reform synagogues. There still are in New Orleans. And uh, the only record I have is having been done in Toro Synagogue, which is where he was based. He lists, though, and I, I'm sorry I don't have the copy here of his music, but there is on the back page of, of some of his music, uh, they list all the synagogues where his music is performed. So one can get an idea. And it's, it's, I counted it 24 states and Canada and England. So there, well, of course, it did spread. Moonlight Sonata thing was, was, that got into even some other yeah. hymnals, didn't it? Right. Well, it's like the Union Hymnal yeah. still has Beethoven's Ninth, the Ode to Joy, yeah, you know, yeah, things like right, that. Right. And so it's yeah. those things. Are there any other particular compositions uh, or settings, or should we say, By that, that, that stand out uh, as interesting? Uh, well, actually, I have not had a chance to perform any of these. It would be nice to have a number of them performed. Uh, the only one I had performed was the, uh, the Moonlight Sonata one. There's no recordings? No, even, even, no, but no. just got together for... Not that I know. So uh, that would be nice to do, to listen to his music and see. Uh, just playing it on the piano, there's nothing striking in the way of harmony. It's, it's as simple as you can imagine, one five, one five sort of things, and um, there's no evidence of any thing that you could call Jewish in the music. So other than occasionally the use of Hebrew, or that the texts were based on um, yeah. some Hebrew. Um, but it's, its claims as a Jewish music is the fact that it was performed in synagogues and therefore served as Jewish music. No, no question. That's, yeah, so. that's, that's uh, very, very much music of, Judaic, of Jewish experience. Yes.